Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Diamond, and I am the Assistant Director of Programs and Innovation at the Harvard Global Health Institute. On behalf of the Harvard Global Health Institute, Novartis Foundation, MIT Critical Data, and the Division of Clinical Informatics at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, it is my honor to welcome you back here today for our second DASH webinar, Data Mining Large Internet Networks to Predict COVID-19 Hotspots. This webinar is the second in a series which will bring together experts from around the world to explore the role of tech and AI in the response to COVID-19. These webinars will specifically focus on low resource settings or those with high socioeconomic disparity. In our last webinar, we heard from leading policymakers about the role of technology in addressing pressing COVID-related health needs. In today's webinar, we will get more specific and hear from leading experts about how data mining large internet networks and other health networks can contribute to the COVID-19 response. Panelists will discuss how this approach and others can overcome structural and political barriers to timely reporting and dissemination and reflect on the partnerships that are needed to move this work forward. It is with great anticipation that I introduce you to our speakers today who will be reflecting on these questions and others within the context of the US, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Dr. Jack Lee is currently a distinguished professor at the Graduate Institute of Biomedical Informatics at Taipei Medical University and chair of the Department of Dermatology at Wang Feng Hospital. His main areas of expertise include artificial intelligence in medicine, patient safety informatics, medical big data analytics. Jack has dedicated himself to evolving the next generation of medical AI for patient safety and prevention, and has been involved deeply not only in biomedical informatics projects in Taiwan, but also developed international collaborations, including in America, Europe, and Africa. Dr. Elaine M. Sosi is a computational epidemiologist with a passion for applying novel data and methods to global health problems. She leads a team of computational social scientists, public health experts, and computer scientists at Boston University's Department of Global Health, where she is an assistant professor. She is also a data science fellow as part of the BU Data Science Initiative at the Harari Institute for Computing. After completing postdoctoral associate positions at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital, Elaine joined the faculty of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. Dr. Marcelo Dagas, Mr. Excuse me, Marcelo D'Agostino currently serves as the Senior Advisor for Information Systems and Digital Health in the Department of Evidence and Intelligence for Actions in Health at the Pan American Health Organization and World Health Organization. He has held a variety of managerial positions there since 2008 including acting as the Senior Advisor for Knowledge Management and the Director for Knowledge Management in Communications, Bioethics, and Research. His experience includes working as a consultant at the Pan American Center for Foot and Mouth Disease in Brazil, a program analyst for the Pan American Institute for Food Protection and Zoonosis, and the coordinator of the Technical Cooperation Agreement between the Latin American Center for Health Science Information and the National Health Surveillance Agency. Lastly, this session is moderated by Dr. Yuri Quintana, Chief of the Division of Clinical Informatics at Beth Israel Medical Deaconess Center and Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Yuri's research focus on developing innovative technologies and systems that empower communities of healthcare professionals, patients, and families. He has developed several award-winning global online and mobile collaboration networks that have had a transformational impact on healthcare delivery. At Harvard, Yuri and colleagues have created InfoSage Health, a family-centered private social network for supporting the care of older adults. He has developed Alicanto, an online social learning platform for health professionals that is used at leading academic hospitals and centers. With Homewood Research Institute and international colleagues, he is also working on improved methods to evaluate mental health apps using evidence-based approaches. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping messages. 
We'll be running a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. So we have enabled our ask a question feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the webinar, just pop them in there and we'll do our very best to answer them. This video is being streamed live through Zoom, Facebook, and a recording will be made available about a half day later on the DASH website. For today's structure, each panelist will open with a brief presentation and remarks, will transition to a discussion and finish with Q&A from the audience. With that, I'm excited to hand the mic over to Yuri, who will be leading the discussion today. Great, thank you very much. Uh... Megan, and uh, thank you to the Harvard Global Health Institute and Novartis Foundation uh, for your leadership and support in organizing this webinar series. Um, I think uh, we all uh, realize now that the COVID-19 pandemic is having dramatic and unprecedented impacts uh, globally and in our lives. Um, and in cease, uh, these changes and these impacts are felt even more so in countries and regions with limited resources. Um, today, we're gonna to look at how uh, techniques from artificial intelligence can support the response uh, for COVID-19 uh, in areas such as outbreak, outbreak detection, um, modeling the disease progression, and how we take that knowledge to uh, develop policies that can benefit society. Uh, it's clear that to be able to do this, we need to do this globally. We can't, just can't solve it in one region of the world and be done with it. It's a global problem and it's gonna require global uh, collaborations. Um, so today we're gonna look at um, various uh, presentations from our panelists on how they're developing this. And in the discussion, we're gonna look at uh, the challenges that there are in implementing these, particularly in low and middle income countries. Uh, we're going to discuss how can we work together to improve how we collect data, particularly in low and middle income countries. How can we make that data available more widely uh, to be able to do analysis, research, and development of systems? What are the challenges of how we encode that data, particularly for COVID and in developing countries, um, and use uh, terminology uh, such as tools that are being provided by different groups, such as Open Concept Lab to, um, and CL to make the interoperability better? And how do we consent to the collection of data uh, in a way that's ethically responsible? We're also gonna look at uh, some of these different solutions and talk about how do we go about evaluating these systems? How do we take uh, these models and adapt them to low and middle income countries uh, what kinds of uh, modifications do we need to do? And how do we evaluate them in a way that's open and uh, shows what data was used, what methods uh, have, uh, have been used, and how these could be used uh, for others to learn and adapt to their particular regions. And finally, we're gonna talk about policy implications. Once we have the systems and uh, these results, how do we use them? to influence in an informed way how we go about reopening society? How do we go about reaching out to underserved areas? Um, and in particular, uh, we need to talk about whether this technology is going to benefit those regions of the world that already have uh, high uh, data and technology, or are we actually going to find cooperative ways to uh, implement systems to reach other parts of the world that have been underserved? And how can we work together as citizens, as organizations and institutes uh, to develop cooperative ethical standards in this COVID area? Now, we probably won't get around to all of these questions and there'll be many more from the panelists, but we hope that this session starts at this global discussion, um, some that have already started in, uh, on different consortiums, um, but that we learn from each other and find ways to cooperate to build scalable systems that are global and benefit uh, all of our societies. So with that, I wanna um, uh, pass over the uh, presentation to Dr. Jack Lee. Um, and I've known do uh, Dr. Jack Lee for many years and he's done tremendous work around the world and we've been co collaborating on various projects um, and uh, he's always at the cutting edge. And so it's a thrill to sort of have him share with us what his team are, are doing. Um, so Dr. Lee, uh, please take it away. 
Okay, thank you, Yuri. Um, so I would like to start uh, by by taking your attention to some of the papers that's published, um, like the one on the right upper corner, response to COVID-19 in Taiwan, big data analytics, new technology, and proactive testing. This is published in uh, uh, the 3rd of March in, in JAMA um, by Dr. Jason Wong from Stanford University. So if you're interested in what big data has been uh, put in use in Taiwan to stop the uh, to stop the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, this will be a good starting uh, point. On the left lower corner, that's another interesting paper. That's how in Taiwan we use the mobile data uh, from the mobile network to trace 600,000 people that actually uh, was in contact with a cruise ship called Diamond Princess uh, that, that has 2,000 people that they had a one day tour in Taiwan in the end of January. And three days later, uh, it was reported that there are several people on board that has COVID-19. So we, we use the mobile phone data network and, and look at all the, the people that they have in 100 meter contact with, with the 2,000 tourists, one day tourists. And we end up having uh, picking up 600,000 people and we met them and screened them uh, uh, and the results of the uh, uh, of all the, the diagnosis were there. Um, on the left upper corner is the application of Google search trends for risk communication in infectious disease management, a case study of a COVID-19 outbreak in Taiwan. This paper was published from, from one of the faculty members in my lab. Uh, so we use this uh, Google search trend for risk communication, it's quite clear in the title. On the right lower corner, this is one app that's used almost by everybody in Taiwan uh, that, that was originally provide a something called the uh, health, My Health Bank. Uh, in this My Health Bank, you can look at your personal health record and, and your EHR uh, for as long as past three years. But we use this app to provide a, uh, um, a place that you can actually buy masks online from the government using the, the, the lowest amount of price and you're guaranteed nine masks per two weeks. Okay, so every two weeks you can get online and buy at least nine masks. So we've never had a mask shortage problem. Um, so these are just, just uh, tiny examples that you can see um, by taking advantage of the technology that's available uh, in order to ease the fear or the panic uh, of the population and to trace the, the pandemic and to control the pandemic. So uh, Taiwan has been uh, doing quite a good job. We have already had no new case in the past 26 days. Uh, we have about six deaths and only 200 people got uh, infected. Uh, so considering the proximity in Taiwan to China and, 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 and we, any time of the day, of course, before the pandemic, we have a million people uh, coming back and forth from and to, to China. So uh, we've been doing quite a good job. Also, there's a very interesting and very important recommendation from the International Medical Informatics Association um, and the International Academy of Health Sciences Informatics which I'm also a member to, uh, we release a recommendation to WHO on the use of informatics in the pandemic situation on the 1st of April. Um, and in the recommendation, there are four major principles. The first one is predict, okay? Um, this is why we're talking about data mining. I mean, um, we, we have to be able to predict to control the fear. Uh, in Taiwan, we call it precision prevention, meaning we, we do not, we, we never had a lockdown. Meaning people in the past three months, four months, people are going shopping, going to restaurant, going to the parks as usual. Although we maintain social distance, but we never had a lockdown. But for people who, who we pinpoint are high risk, they are probably quarantined at home or for the very high risk people, they're quarantined in place. But most people are not even uh, limited uh, to, to, to the activity, that, that their, their daily activity. Um, so with enough big data, we can actually do a precision prevention without locking everybody at home. 
uh, which in turn bring us the economy downturn that they've never seen. It's the worst in history. So that's the first recommendation is to predict using data and AI to predict. The second recommendation is telemedicine. I'll just go one by one through the slides. So um, we should uh, move most people out of the hospital and out of the clinic so people could actually just you know, see their doctor uh, online unless there, there has to be intervention, there has to be you know, physical examination and checkup. But, but, but before that, we, can, we should actually uh, move or visit online as much as possible. Uh, this is one example that we set up a, a Facebook website uh, called TW Can Help. And, and we have 50 dermatologists volunteer to help people online. So if you have a question, you're quarantined at home, you can actually go there and, and, and have, a, have your question answered. The third recommendation is sharing, and of course, big data, which, which is the theme of this whole talk. But the problem with the international COVID-19 data set so far is that um, it's quite inconsistent. And it's um, inconsistent in terms of granularity, in terms of format, in terms of data model, in terms of dimensions. Um, although there are countries that's sharing their patient level data on Kaggle, but they're all sharing with different data model and different granularity. For example, Italy shared their data based on cities, not even patient level. Korean, although share their, share their patient level data, but, but it's only very, very, uh, very, very rough data for each patient, like, like gender and, and, and age. Uh, so very little electronic health record data. Um, the last recommendation is transparency. Uh, so we have to make sure that the data source are reliable um, and it's shared and exchanged with every part of the world. We cannot isolate a small part of the world that we, we don't want to share and we only share with our friends and allies. That's what you know, actually caused part of the pandemic today. Um, we should take advantage of the social media. The way, of course, the, uh, people complain about fake news on social media, but but this is also a very good place to share real data and real news. Uh, we've seen a lot of paper with biased sampling, overfitting, and even fake data. So, and that's not helping. That's only going to make things worse. So transparency is the key in fighting this kind of uh, pandemic. That, that's all I have to share. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Um, and uh, let's uh, pass it over now to Dr. Uh, Nasasi, please. If you, uh, go ahead. Hi. Um, so thank you so much for including me in this conversation. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about some of the work that we've done from the start of the pandemic in Africa to now. So in the beginning, our focus was around raising awareness. So we worked with people on the continent to develop materials that they could share on social media platforms, but could also share in their local communities as well. And so this included developing things like illustrations of what people should do when they get sick or how people can social distance to, to if someone else is sick or if they have symptoms or uh, coronavirus symptoms. Um, some of that work was done with the Ministry of Education in Sierra Leone. And we also worked with local artists in countries like Tanzania. And the, the illustrations we developed were translated to several different languages, both in West Africa, but also East Africa, and were shared on social media platforms and also locally. So people actually printed um, some of these illustrations to share with, with people in your communities. And I think that's very important because whatever solutions we're trying to develop, it's important for us to think about the local context and to think about engaging people in local communities and figuring out how can they take this information and share with people who might not have access to the internet, who might not be using the kinds of technology that we, we, we tend to use to um, address these pandemics. Um, another thing that we've been working on is data collection. And this has been part of a larger global effort to collect epidemiological data on COVID-19. 
And so we've been collecting data from ministries of health websites, social media as well, and also news reports to see if we can have a concise, um, a comprehensive collection of what is happening on the continent. So what are different countries reporting in terms of cases? Uh, what are the symptoms of the cases? Um, recoveries um, and what is so for each individual case that has been reported what is the status of that case we also want to know things about travel they have those cases that those travel related cases or is that due to local transmission of disease and we've had volunteers from across the continent but have also had people who are from from other parts of the world also contributing to this effort and some of the challenges that we've had, Jack has mentioned some of this, is inconsistency in, in reporting. So different countries are reporting different types of data or not reporting any demographic data at all. So some countries at the beginning of their epidemic reported the demographics for each case, but then as the epidemic advances, you see less reporting of, of case information and most of the information that is presented is very general. Currently, what we're looking at is how can we use data from social media sources for understanding information needs. So what are people searching for? What, what do people seem to understand or not understand at the moment? And how can social media platforms be used for informing individuals? And also looking at misinformation. So what types of misinformation are spreading across different communities on places like Twitter, but also on WhatsApp? So what are people sharing? What are people as believing to be treatments for COVID-19, for example, and how, how, what are ways in which we can respond to misinformation early on to stop its potential impact on the health of individuals in different communities across Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I think that's all I have, so thank you. Okay, thank you so much for sharing those insights from, um, from Africa. We really appreciate it. We'll delve into this uh, more in the discussion. Um, I'd like to pass it over now to Marcelo D'Agostino uh, from the Pan American Health Organization to share um, his insights. Thank you very much, uh, jury and colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So I will pass a little bit uh, the information about uh, the situation in the Americas. Uh, until today, we have 1.5 million of confirmed cases uh, in uh, 54 countries, areas, or territories that we have uh, in the Americas. So I will focus on the challenges. Um, the first thing, uh, and although it's a, a little bit obvious, and everybody knows that, but we need to have a clear understanding that pandemics do not spread uh, among different populations in the same manner, uh, and we need information to identify and to characterize the factors that, that slow or accelerate the transmission, uh, in particular in the most uh, vulnerable uh, uh, population. Let me, let me start my video. Uh, there is a problem with the connectivity uh, here. So. Uh, so, and therefore, one of the initial challenges that I want to highlight, that, and I am sure is the uh, same in all the regions, is how to collect uh, disaggregated data. This is what we need uh, today. Uh, but uh, together with that, we have an additional challenge that I want to put also on the table to see if also if there is the same situation uh, in other regions, is uh, about the challenge that we have with small countries and territories because we have small numbers and having small numbers may affect uh, predictions and modeling. But at the same time, those are the countries that are needed uh, strong recommendations on how to strengthen health systems now. Uh, but in particular, uh, looking at disaggregated data is the issue of connectivity. And this is a region in where we have 25% uh, of the Americas is uh, without internet connection. So the key question is how to collect data and good data or quality data in situations in where we don't have any connectivity at all. So how to lead with that situation. And, and, I, and I like the previous speaker that they mentioned that they were working 
with education because sometimes uh, countries that they have a lot of big territories in the Amazonas, for example, they share connectivity between schools and, and primary care facility. The other uh, big challenge that we have is in relation to the concept of openness. Now more than ever, we need to have open data, we need to have open content, we need to have an open science. Uh, but we are still facing some situations related to that. Uh, we need to have everything as much as possible solution must be open source. Um, but it's not so easy uh, to get that, uh, at least in our, in our region. Um, another thing that, that, that seems to be a simple issue, but this is extremely important, and, and what we do in the Americas is we have uh, different groups with all the heads of digital health and information systems across the America, and, and where we take every morning what are the needs, what are the challenges, and what big challenge is for the people and health workers to understand the power of, of the technologies, because everybody thinks that they understand everything, but there is a huge potential uh, if we can uh, understand much better, not only technology per se, but the situation that we have here is that we also need to uh, complement these activities with some education, uh, and some communication campaigns uh, because we uh, at the time that we say we need to do tele everything teleconsulting for everything uh, it is not as simple as that that every single person from one day to the other understand how to use that technologies and for what purpose uh, for example we are now working with experts from four collaborating centers from WHO in a very single document, but critical one, that is what is possible through teleconsulting, but what is not possible? Uh, because this is a recurrent question that we have almost um, every single day. And, and finally, uh, I want to raise an issue that, that was discussed also by our headquarters people in Geneva and was mentioned by the first speaker is about the, the infodemic. Uh, it is extremely difficult today to manage uh, the amount of information that is available, but also uh, how to make some critical decisions based on the information that we have, how to know which one are the trusted sources that we have. Uh, people say, okay, it is good that we have fact-checking website, but not everyone understands what is a fact-checking website. Uh, so this is another challenge that we have. And finally, I think uh, that the biggest challenge that we have is to ensure convergency in the use of data, information, knowledge, and technology. Uh, it doesn't mean that if we have access to a lot of databases uh, without the understanding of how to use this, it's like having nothing. So it is critical now to uh, complement any uh, activity related to the fight against the pandemic with some digital literacy uh, approach. So we need to strengthen also the capacity and the competencies of the health workers, in particular the one that in the first level of care and in primary health facilities. So I will stop here. This, those are the, are the challenges that we are facing uh, in the Americas, uh, but also we are sharing that once a week with uh, our colleagues in Geneva. So this is almost a a picture of, of all the regions in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcelo, and uh, the great work that you and colleagues um, are doing to help and support uh, the development of systems and policies and procedures. And so as you touched on, um, all of the panelists touched on a lot of great points. Um, I wanted to maybe um, have um, an initial discussion on something that all of you have talked about is the uh, challenges of data um, and collecting of uh, the data. Um, there are limited, um, con there are connectivity issues, people with limited um, uh, numbers, of people with internet access, um, the uh, need to have, and Dr. Lee talked about granularity and in in consistency. And uh, to be able to aggregate our data, we're going to need to be able to uh, come to some sorts of agreements of what data is useful to collect, given that we're really short of time. 
um, and uh, how uh, we can then train people on collecting that data. And so um, maybe I, I'd like to first start with Dr. Uh, Lee, uh, since you're the newly elected, uh, in, uh, will be the future incoming president for the International Medical Informatics Association. And you mentioned a, um, a policy document that EMEA has put out, and you also talked about, about the granularities. Uh, Dr. Lee, maybe if you could talk a bit about how we could um, move forward on having a better consensus of the data that we need to collect. And then um, maybe if Elaine and Marcelo could talk about how we could help um, train people once we have some sort of agreements. How do, we, how do we do capacity development in Africa and Latin America? What are some strategies? So Dr. Lee, what are your thoughts of how do we tackle the problem of data inconsistency and collection? Thank you, Yuri. Um, well, actually, based on our, our experience in back in 2003, when we had SARS, which is also a type of coronavirus, 17 years ago, uh, now we are going back to dig up this old data set 17 years ago, and we found out we did not do a good job in terms of collecting the data, not to mention the consistency, the granularity, the deficit dimension, we did not even collect um, a whole range of data about the SARS patients uh, because back then, like many countries right now, our health system were overwhelmed um, by, by the patients, by SARS patients. In the ICU were flooded and we don't have enough negative pressure um, wards and, and all that. So uh, we're just overwhelmed and the ERs overcrowded and then people were panicking. So, so we did a very lousy job in terms of collecting electronic health record for SARS patients. So the data become, you know, uh, fragmented uh, and, and here and there and inconsistent as well. So, uh, so now we are facing COVID-19 um, and they're, they're, patient, they're, they're experts saying that we're not able to use AI to actually help COVID-19 right now. But next time when the coronavirus came back, might, we might have some AI that we can use because current AI are mostly based on machine learning and machine learning based on good data, big data. Um, but again, when we, are, when we are looking at some many countries of the world, uh, the hospitals were still overwhelmed and things are not documented. Uh, and they're running out of ventilators, they're running out of drugs, they're running out of nurses and doctors. So if we still do a poorly documentation, we'll never have data to learn. So next time, COVID-19, COVID-20, 23, 24, when, when it comes back, we still don't have good data and we will overwhelm again and, and the old story will repeat itself. So, so I think we should start by doing a good job in terms of documenting um, or the, the patient that we have. And, and then we can start by uh, sharing data, sharing data model, uh, and, and, and you know, allow more open data for people to do research upon. Uh, but, but I think now we re what we really need to do is to tell all the countries in the world that please do a, a good job in terms of documenting the data and, and share along the way as much as we can so we can take advantage of the data, we could, we could utilize the data and develop models that could help us right now, not in the next time. Because if we're looking forward to the next time, and, and, and if there's next time, unfortunately, we're not going to, to, to be able to use the data now because we're not paying attention to the collection and the quality and, and all the standards right, um, of the data that we're collecting. So, so I think what we should be doing now is really we should pay attention to the documentation of, of all the COVID-19 patients and the linking to the to all the lab, to the exams, to the past medical record, to the electronic record that, that the patient has. And we should pull together a, 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 like GenBank. I, I like to use the example back in the year 1990s, uh, the world is trying to do the ge genetic mapping, the genome map, the human genome project. And because of the gem bank, uh, the European countries in America and Japan all share what they're finding on the Human Genome Project and, and that they end up speed up the Human Genome Project for like 50% of the time. 
So I think that kind of spirit is something we can use. We should create the, you know, the gem bank of COVID-19 right now because we all need it. And and if we don't need if we don't use it now, we're going to use it in the future. So uh, so let's let's put together, you know, and and and, uh, and really pay attention to to the data curation and the data collection right now. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, Dr. Uh, Nosesi, can you give your perspective on this? Yeah, so I, I think when you look at countries in sub-Saharan Africa, many of them don't have really good disease surveillance systems. So I think we have to start from there. We have to start thinking, how do we create a better surveillance system right now that we can sustain throughout the pandemic, but also after the pandemic? So what kinds of information do we need to document? What do we need to know about cases as they're being reported that could help us understand the epidemiology of the disease on the continent that could help inform the public? Because I think that if the public is better informed about what is happening in their communities, that will build trust in the government, but it will also reduce misinformation. Because if people know what is happening, then they don't have to go somewhere else to try to find that information. So you talk to people in some countries where they, there is not much control or much acknowledgement about the spread of COVID-19, and they are hearing all kinds of things that are possibly happening in their communities. But if the government takes charge and becomes responsible in reporting that information and addressing what is happening in your communities and people don't have to be listening to everything else that others are telling them about um, COVID-19 in your communities. So I think it's important for us to identify what we, we should be documenting during this pandemic, uh, as I've mentioned, but also other infectious diseases as well to build systems that we can sustain throughout. And one way in which we can train people, which is, uh, as you mentioned before, is to work with people who are already seen as authorities on it, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So Africa CDC has been a leader in addressing COVID-19 on the continent. So working with Africa CDC to develop things like webinars to train medical professionals on what kind of data they should be collecting and how they could leverage some of the expertise in the continent, so data science expertise on the continent to present this data in a way that the public can use to better understand COVID-19. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Marcelo, uh, can you share your perspectives? On this? Yeah, thank you very much. The first thing I want to just, if possible, to copy and paste what the previous speakers uh, mentioned uh, about the uh, documentation and, and information sharing, looking at the long term. I think this is critical. What I do believe, uh, according to, based on your question, Yuri, about training, uh, I think that something that is needed uh, is, first of all, we need to customize training based on the uh, each country context, social, political, cultural. We cannot have a, a one strategy that will fit to all the countries. This is something that will be just a paper published anywhere, but we need to work country by country, and this is something that, 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 can, that is possible. But the other thing that is related to data collection or the use of data nah, is related with one initiative that, that, that you participated, uh, Yuri, that was Information Systems for Health. Uh, uh, this is the time to really adopt the concept of instead of health information system, go with information system for health. The data that is needed today more than ever come from different sectors, from uh, economy, education, agriculture. So it's bigger than health. This is why we reinforce this concept of that information systems are for health and not just health information systems. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you uh, so much. So it, uh, clearly it, it seems that we do have uh, a need to have more dialogue over what kind of data we need to collect um, and regional uh, country specific uh, training. Um, my own experience is, you know, even in, um, in any country, Brazil is, is a continent that, uh, as Marcela has observed many times, a continent in itself. 
um, many countries have uh, great uh, differences and disparities. So urban centers, capital centers have more resources uh, than others. And so how you train the rural uh, counties will be, will be different. So not only country by country, we may need to have, you know, region by region as well uh, to be able um, uh, to do that. Um, and I think um, some of the projects that I've been involved, we sometimes have collected too much data. <laughs> and people don't have enough time. So I think the, uh, the organizations that you represent, um, International Medical uh, Informatics Association, um, at the CDC, uh, PAHO, WHO, um, the American Medical Informatics Association, and, and institutes such as the Harvard Global Health all have uh, something to contribute. And I know there's a lot of dialogue going on, but if we can connect the dots and try to reduce duplication of effort, I think it'd be great. And so um, um, I think this is uh, helpful to, to learn more about um, uh, your, uh, your organizations. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about um, something that was uh, mentioned a few times and that's sort of the misinformation that there is. And we, we have sort of another pandemic in this pandemic of misinformation, um, which sort of creates a lot of fear, mistrust, confusion, it's hard um, uh, to do that. Um, and um, Elaine talked a little bit about sort of um, uh, strategies that they've done in terms of social media uh, um, to, to uh, data mine questions and concerns. Um, and so while there's also the breakout of the disease, there's also the breakout of fear and despair and things like that. And so um, I'd like to sort of talk a bit about sort of how we can use uh, data mining to um, look at social media um, and then what are the strategies that we can do to sort of fight that uh, that are country specific and um, um, perhaps we'll start with Elaine um, if you could maybe um, share with us a bit more about your insights um, in um, from Africa uh, on this topic uh, and then maybe we'll go to Marcelo in Latin America and and Jack, we'll go to you last because I think Taiwan has had the experience of SARS and you're, you're more advanced. You've, you've been through this a, a few more times. So maybe the challenge is not as great here, but let's start with Elaine. What, what do you view as an effective strategy um, uh, for dealing with the uh, misinformation pandemic? I think having authorities respond to misinformation in a timely manner is one way of addressing this. So WHO and other um, organizations like Africa CDC have the power to say, this is untrue and people will actually listen to them. But that also means that people have to have access to this, to this organization, whether it's via social media or via websites. But that's not always true in many local communities because not everyone is going to this. Not everyone has access to the internet or maybe it's too expensive for them to be spending time on the internet. So we have to think about local strategies. How do we have, um, how do we use local mediums of communication to inform people about coronavirus? So how do we spread true information such that when a misinformation pops up, people are able to identify it as misinformation because they've been educated enough on what coronavirus is and what the symptoms are, what the treatments are, what is being done about vaccines at the moment, such that when something false comes up, they can respond to it. And this can be done through radio, local radio stations. This can be done using community leaders in rural areas who can actually educate people in their communities about misinformation, um, looking, using local television, um, community announcers in villages. So those individuals can play significant roles in sharing information about coronavirus in a way that we might not be able to get people to find that information on social media or other platforms. Um, also just, individual responses. So I, I see uh, misinformation, not just on social media platforms, but also on my WhatsApp networks where people forward things to me. So being able to respond to them and say this is untrue and pointing them back to, to uh, 
a reliable resource like the WHO. So WHO has a misinformation um, or myth buster number on WhatsApp that you can you can type like one and get information on what's happening about coronavirus. And I don't think they're responding to questions yet, but you could definitely contact them on other platforms and ask questions and then they would respond to to misinformation on the on their websites as well. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Marcelo, your thoughts on, on this topic? Yeah, thank you, Yuri. I, I, I think that you raised the, the, the billion dollar question, no? because uh, uh, the infodemic, um, another concept like infoxication and all of that are before the pandemic. Uh, I, I, how to find a solution uh, in something that was created by definition, the web is a chaotic space with no strong regulations in where I can put whatever I want. There is no accountability. So how to control that is extremely complex because sometimes uh, imagine that we have only 50 websites in the world and I say, and I will develop one that will solve the problem. At the end, we have 51 websites. So we need to, uh, maybe it's time I think that the solution is a long-term solution. We need to start educating people since they are in primary schools about how to search, how to understand uh, critical and trusted source. And then one day we will have that in place. But I don't think that we will find a solution right now uh, because there is no strong regulation that can be applied. There is no accountability. But what I do believe is that we can play a critical role uh, through social media, social networks, uh, because more and more people are trusting what other people who you trust are reading or are publishing. So this is a good way to be informed. People are using that today. Uh, we did an analysis and we published a paper with, uh, with uh, Dengue Zika and Chikungunya and we discovered that if one epidemiologist wants to read what was published in six months, you need to spend 50 years without sleeping to consume everything that is published. So it isn't possible to control. But I think that through influencers and social networking, at least we can accommodate a little bit what to read, how to read, when to read, and, and, and what to share, because we all believe that everybody's doing and infodemia except for us. So we also need to be part of, of the solution. Thank you so much, Marcelo. And Jack, uh, your views on the topic. Okay. Um, I think one of the most important um, uh, points um, is to control the narrative, uh, meaning the government uh, has to really put themselves in a position of controlling the narrative. And in our case, uh, we have a live broadcast every day in the afternoon from two o'clock to three o'clock, sometimes one hour, sometimes a little short, a little more. And it's always hosted by the Minister of Health. Um, he will detail what happened today and how many cases and why should we wear a mask? Why should we do this? Why should we do that? And, and also, uh, the paper that I mentioned in my first slide, published from Taiwan, from our institute in the International Journal of Infectious Disease, actually detail how we use Google Trend to know what our people is worrying about. So uh, in the initial period, like in January, people, all the people search for is about masks, where to buy masks. Right. So, so, uh, and then after that, people worry about what are the things that they use to wash hands. Okay. Do they, you know, then there's certainly there's a shortage of uh, seventy five percent alcohol, which we never have a, a shortage of. Um, so that social network is quite important to know what your people is worrying about, um, and because of the the very deep political and economical implication uh, of this, this disease, this pandemic, uh, we cannot expect all the governments uh, to be really, really transparent all the time. Um, as you can see, some of the governments struggle with transparency. 
Uh, so, so I think uh, it's very important to uh, to have common sense, have judgment, like like the other panelists were, were mentioning. Um, but but it's important that the government should uh, um, or or scientists or or, or a, a important organization uh, of the country should to control the narrative and really care about what people care about. Uh, and I, I don't think it's it's prudent. Uh, like some country, their president will go on the TV and say which drug is very effective. That that's not that's a kind of a out of control narrative. You know, people just go on TV and and, and do whatever let's say whatever they want. So that's bad. So we should have a a a place a center like an anchoring. Uh, you know, people are now now listening to this this afternoon broadcast every day, and that kind of calm them down. And make make them you know more compliant and more more cooperative in terms of uh, controlling the pandemic. Great, thank you so much. Um, when uh, looking at some of the questions that have come in, uh, people are asking about um, what tools are particularly useful. We've mentioned um, some of them here, um, particularly and. Uh, some of the panelists could maybe talk about some of the uh, tools that are particularly useful for um, uh, low and middle income countries. I know that there are, um, you know, open source tools. Um, DHIS is one tool for aggregating data, Comcare and others. Um, a couple more questions um, on protocols um, that we could adapt for emergency response. And so maybe if we could talk a bit about uh, what do you think are some available tools that people could use uh, to develop solutions in low income countries that are uh, more affordable and uh, available, uh, or, or if you think that we don't have enough um, tools available, um, whether we need more training, and, and how e easy is it really to adapt the protocols that we have for modeling and prediction? The, mostly have been done in higher income countries how, do, how difficult is it to adapt those models um, uh, for low and middle income countries? Um, and so maybe let's start with maybe with Jack, if you could talk a bit and then go to Elaine and, and Marcel. Okay, I can talk a little bit about um, how to build a model even you don't have um, all the data and, and, and a lot of computer scientists and, and a lot of tools in, in the low and middle income country. Uh, you know, one way we, we we do we do have an example that we participate in the MIT COVID nineteen hackathon. We review all the papers um, that have the risk factor and the odds ratio of each risk factor for people that would be at risk for COVID nineteen. So you review all the odds ratio and you can easily plug in the odds ratio into any tools that that compute odds ratio. Okay, there are just so many of them online or, or their apps or you can develop very simple apps or you can use excel <laughs> you know as simple as excel you can you can actually plug in all the numbers you've collected from the uh, reviewing the papers the papers that you believe that that that's more uh, a well-respected journal and stuff like that and you can create a model to stratify the risk of of each person in your city in your country in your village um, in terms of the risk of getting COVID-19. So this is just one example that you don't actually have to have an army of scientists or data scientists uh, and an army of computer scientists in order to make it useful, uh, a useful tool. So, so I think uh, it's probably not, not a specific tool like you have to have SES or SPSS or any other specific tool that you have to buy. Uh, any any simple computation tools with the right plug-in of knowledge, plug-in of numbers. Uh, it could be a useful tool for, uh, depends on the purpose uh, of things that you want to do. So, so my example, you know, for the limited time we have, is to build a tool that will predict the risk of the people contracting COVID-19. So it's not just age, gender, comorbidity, environment, uh, lifestyle, and, and habit, and all that, right? So. Um, so I think you don't you don't really need a lot of resources to to, to do that. Okay, Elaine, would you like to comment on that? Yes. Um, so to to build on uh, Jack's comment, I think it depends on what 
you want to use the tool for? So what is the purpose and what are the questions that you're trying to answer? Um, so in Sub-Saharan Africa, you want to think about demographics. Uh, we know that the demographics in Sub-Saharan Africa is very different from what we have for the rest of the world. Um, the median age is 19 years old, which is very significant, different from what you have in Europe or in, in um, the US. You also want to think about social distancing when you're modeling as well. Um, what does it mean to implement social distancing in this in this context and what does adherence look like? It's definitely not going to be the same uh, compared to countries where people have more resources or are more likely to stay at home because they have access to resources. In some of these places, people have to work daily to make money to feed their families. And so adherence to social distancing or lockdowns is different. So that's something that you have to think about when you're modeling something like disease transmission. Um, but I think the most important question to ask is what will be most useful in this context? So what is the most need at this moment? Um, should we be looking at hospital resources? Should we, should we be looking at maximizing testing resources that are limited in some places? Um, should we be looking at economic impacts of the virus? Um, how would that lead to more, um, how would that have lead to a more severe impact than the virus itself, than the number of cases that, that we're seeing? Or should we be thinking more about maintenance of services for non-COVID diseases? So we know that as the number of cases rises in, in a lot of places, people are seeking less, um, seeking less medical care for all the conditions. So how would this impact countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, will we have more people dying from malaria because you're not going to hospitals, either because you don't understand that they can still seek care for those conditions um, because of COVID, or maybe the resources to address those other um, diseases currently don't exist. And one other thing that I think is very important to think about, and I think about this when we think about misinformation, is fake medications. So there's likely to be a rise in fake medications as people are trying to treat COVID in these countries. So can we develop tools? And I think AI would definitely work in this in this situation because there are already startups that are addressing this, like um, TrueSpec Africa looks at how to identify fake medications using AI. So I think that's something that people can be thinking about. The other questions that we should be looking at rather than just projecting the spread of COVID across countries. Great. Uh, and Marcelo, um, if you could- Very quick, the tool that, that we are trying to implement in all the countries is the one developed by our colleagues in headquarters, the Go Data platform. Uh, it's a very simple tool, easy to install, easy to use, easy to maintain. And, and we are working with development partners, so they are willing to also to reaccommodate some uh, funds that they have under loans that they have with countries in order to implement, but also to have the uh, appropriate IT infrastructure to run the, that platform. And we have a very uh, interesting group uh, in Geneva supporting as a, like a virtual help desk group uh, on that. And, and at PAHO, we created something that we call the virtual office for technical cooperation. So we have a network of people supporting countries in the implementation of the Go Data uh, platform. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much, Marcelo. Uh, and so we're coming up to the top of the hour. So. Um, I want to sort of uh, wrap up and um, summarize some of the things that we've talked about. So we've talked about the need to have uh, more dialogue and agree on what data we should collect. Um, and um, we've also talked about the need to provide training for people and to figure out how to operationalize this within uh, what is already a busy um, healthcare system, which is even now even more stressed. So how do we efficiently um, train and uh, integrate the process so that we're ready for the next uh, pandemic? So training is um, another theme that uh, uh, came across. We've talked about um, some of the different technologies um, that are, uh, different people are using. Um, and we've also talked a little bit about the need to sort of evaluate this in models um, in uh, low and middle income countries. 
to make uh, adaptations based on geography, age, demographics, um, and social determinants of health, which vary by region and by country. Um, and so one of the great things about, well, not too many great things, but one of the good things about this is that it's uh, made available more data sets, more literature available for everyone uh, uh, available. But I, uh, it's clear that to operationalize this um, and be able to sustain it, we're going to need to have more cooperation, more training, and, and more, more facilities. Um, I think there are some great organizations that uh, people can reach out to and, and get involved. And um, we've mentioned a few of them. I know there's many other ones, EMEA, PAHO, and um, other CDC and other groups are, are doing a lot of work. And hopefully we can continue the dialogue and uh, avoid duplication and synergize uh, our efforts. So I'm gonna pass it back to Megan to uh, close the session. Great, thank you so much, Yuri. Uh, this concludes our second Data Science and AI Summits for Healthcare webinar. Uh, many thanks to our panelists, Elaine, Jack, Marcelo, and Yuri for joining us. In such uncertain times as these, it's really comforting to know that this set of esteemed panelists are thinking critically about innovative ways to tackle COVID globally. To our audience, thank you for joining us again in submitting thought-provoking questions. We hope to see you on our next webinar, for which details will be forthcoming on our website and social media platforms in the next couple of days. Have a wonderful afternoon and evening and take care of yourselves and others. Goodbye.